Okie dokie. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. It's 7 o'clock, so I'm going to kick things off here. Um, I'm Steve Carlson. I'm a staff member at Practical Farmers of Iowa, and I'll be kind of uh, hosting tonight. Um, I'm at the PFI office, which is in Ames, Iowa. And uh, tonight's farminar topic is on achieving a farm life balance for CSA farmers. And tonight will be led by PFI member Kate Edwards of Wildwoods Farm near Iowa City, as well as Kristen Cordette of Blue Moon Community Farm near Madison, Wisconsin. And Kate's going to lead things off and she'll draw from her, I think, seven years of farming experience now. And then after Kate, Kristen will take over to draw from about 12 years of experience um, growing fruits and vegetables in, in the, uh, the community-supported agriculture format. So I'm going to do a little bit of a Practical Farmers of Iowa introduction here. And while I'm speaking, I'm going to pull up two um, polls that we're, we're just looking for for you to tell us whether or not you're currently farming. And then if you're running a CSA, how big your CSA is. So let me pull up these polls, and you can take those while I do a little PFI spiel. So there we go. I'm not going to keep these up all night, so go ahead and check the appropriate boxes when you get a chance there. So this is part of our fall farminar series. This is actually the last topic of what we consider our fall series. And we're going to take a couple weeks off. And then on January 10th, uh, we're going to start our winter farminar series, which will go for about 12 weeks. And then near the end of that, we've got a couple extra topics packed in. So we've got 14 more topics coming up uh, in the winter farm in our series. And um, like I said in the chat box there, if you'd like to be on our uh, email list, I'll send you a reminder about what topics are coming up each week. And when we announce the winter topics uh, in a couple weeks here, um, you'll get that in your inbox. If you do miss any farm in ours, we record all of these and we put them uh, on our website, practicalfarmers.org, in what we call the farm in our archive. There are over 100 farminars that have been archived um, in the past. We've been doing this for many years. So uh, feel free to dig through the farminar archives for other topics that might be of interest to you. So Practical Farmers of Iowa started just over 30 years ago as a nonprofit organization made up of farmers who at that time were interested in reducing inputs and using on-farm research to answer their on-farm questions. And today we're still really focused on the same kind of issues that we were back in 1985. And, and now we're made up of farmers from all enterprises and farms of all sizes. And our membership is also made up of quite a few friends of farmers who don't farm but support the PFI mission. And the mission is strengthening farms and communities through farmer-led investigation and information sharing. And we use this mission uh, to help farmers practice an agriculture that benefits both the land and the people. Our values at PFI are welcoming everyone, creativity, collaboration, and community, viable farms now and for future generations, and stewardship and ecology. And as a member-based nonprofit, we definitely want to encourage you to join us. We have a lot of uh, membership benefits that you can read about, again, on our website at practicalfarmers.org, but essentially a membership allows you to tap into our network of members, which um, you can do in multiple ways. This time of year, our email discussion lists can be pretty active. We have discussion lists that are on cover crops or horticulture or livestock or row crops and um, really great ways to interact with other farmers on um, issues that are important to you. Membership also gives you discounts to our events and the opportunity to participate in on-farm research projects and all of our other programming. So check that out. Also on our website is an event calendar. And we still have quite a few events, whether they're PFI events or um, partner events coming up this time of year. So check the calendar if you're looking for any other education opportunities in your area. And the big event for Practical Farmers of Iowa is coming up pretty soon here, January 20th and 21st here in Ames, Iowa. We hold our annual conference, and we We've got our booklet out now that lists more than 50 sessions that we've got planned over two days. So definitely go um, and check out our conference booklet and, and uh, look at all of the really great educational opportunities that are happening just over two days here in Ames. 
We have a lot of great speakers, a lot of knowledge, a lot of topics to cover. So it's a really great, um, it's a really great weekend. I encourage you to join us for the conference. So then finally, um, throughout the presentations tonight, feel free to use the chat box to ask questions. Uh, if our speakers don't see them or, or it doesn't make sense to answer them at the time, then I'll, I'll uh, chime in later and make sure that we come back and answer the questions. So we'll have about an hour here for presentations, and then we'll save um, you know, 20 to 30 minutes after that time to answer questions that weren't answered yet. So do think of questions. That makes for a great farm and R if you ask them. Put them in the chat box. Um, also, at the near the end of the farm and R tonight, I'm going to pop up another box on the screen here that has a link to do a survey to give us a little bit of feedback on tonight's farm and art, but then also it's your chance to tell us what topics you want to hear about in the future. So uh, just take a quick minute and give us a little feedback at the end of this farm and art. Um, also, so thank you for taking these polls here. It looks like uh, we have everyone that's tuned in it so far is, is currently farming, so that's pretty interesting. And then um, looking at those of you who are doing CSAs, um, that's pretty interesting too. Zero to 49 is about seven of you, the majority of you, over half of you. So really cool. I'm going to um, leave these up for just a second and pull up Kate Edwards' presentation and let Kate take it away, and then I'm going to take these polls down. So Kate, whenever you're ready, you can turn on the mic and, and take this over. I'll get this up. OK, I think my mic is on now. I am really excited to be um, doing this farm and with Kristen. I um, first heard about Kristen's farm last summer when I was in the field, and I was in the middle of the summer looking for some inspiration and listened to a Farmer to Farmer podcast, and was looking through the descriptions of the podcast and was looking for someone um, who was someone that would have been like me at one point. Um, and so Kristen's been farming longer than I have, and is her farm's much bigger than mine, um, but she's a sole operator of her, of her farm, um, which I am as well. And so I was looking for some inspiration um, from someone like that, and it was really exciting to find, um, to quote, discover um, her and um, find her um, presentation, and have really enjoyed the conversations that we've had leading up to this farminar, and can't wait to hear what she has to share with us tonight. So i um, really excited about this opportunity to learn from Kristen and um, also to share a few of my thoughts on work-life balance um, that I've come to work through in the last um, few years um, and hopefully tell a few funny stories of when that didn't quite go so well um, along the way. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is talk a little bit about my farm and then um, go through thoughts on um, my thoughts on work-life balance, and then we'll take it, give it to Kristen. My hope is that my presentation is relatively quick, um, and so that we can get to Kristen's part of the presentation. So if you feel like you want to follow up with me um, in the question box, feel free, or um, later via email, too. Um, I'd love to talk to any of you more. Um, so I'm going to talk um, about my farm, um, my fields, kind of the unique setup of my farm, um, some of the things that I do on the farm to make it um, what it is, and then also share a little bit about work-life balance um, along the way. So um, I have been farming. Um, this is starting my seventh year of operation this following coming season. Um, I was on one property for five years, and then a year ago I moved to a new property and I've um, just completed my first season on the new property. Um, I farm on rented ground, and I have a five-year lease. I own a barn on the ground, um, and that will be bought back by my landlords um, when my lease is up. Um, just to give a little bit of context, I've had about 15 employees since starting the farm, and my farm is located between Solon and Iowa City. Um, this is a picture of one of my fields from midsummer this summer, and this is a brassica field, and you can see that it um, the picture is, oh, that's not where I wanted that, but um, there you go. So that picture is from that section of the field, um, and I have about six acres of crops. So this is my barn. Um, I live in my barn, um, and I have a machine shed in the barn, and I have a packing shed in the barn, and it's provided a really multifunctional way for me to use um, a space pretty efficiently, um, as well as to build equity as a beginning farmer. So I um, am able to, because because of the price of land right now, I would love to buy land but can't, and so by 
I'm putting this money into the building, I'm able to start building equity. And then, like I said, that'll be um, bought back by my landlords at the end of the of my lease. Um, this is some of my equipment. I have three tractors, a gator, um, basket weeder, a tiller. Um, I use soil blocking for my plants. Um, my CSA is vacillates between 140 and 150 members. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context on the size of the CSA, and that's the summer CSA, and then the fall, I had about 90 members in my fall CSA this year. And then in this year, for the first time, I did a holiday like Christmas share um, that I just delivered um, or had people picked up at the farm last weekend, and it did about 55, 60 shares for that. Uh, this is my greenhouse. It's a multifunctional greenhouse that's used um, in the spring for pl uh, plants propagation in the summer for onion drying and in the fall for squash curing. Um, there's a few details on that you can look at later if you're interested in my hoop house. Um, I do a buffet style of CSA distribution, so um, mostly I do some pack shares, um, but the majority of my shares are in the CSA pickup on a buffet style. And um, I have about six locations. All of my locations are within 10 miles of my farm. Um, and I have two delivery days for efficiency purposes. It's all split between those two days. And I do some cover cropping, um, not as much as I'd like, but I'm doing increasingly more. This is some of the examples of what I did this last year for cover cropping. And I'm hoping to do more as time goes on and get that more integrated into my operation. Uh, my lease is a five-year lease with an option to opt out at year two. Um, I have $100,000 equity in the building, which is reimbursable um, at the time of my um, <clears throat> leaving. So the money that I'm putting towards that loan is what I'm building in equity right now. And through the lease, I'm committing to conservation practices, and I also, through the lease, have access to water and fencing. This is my financials. Um, in 2011, um, I was grossing about $10,000 and netting $3,000, and now I'm grossing about $80,000 and netting $24,000. Um, this is just for context. You can look at it more later if you have questions. Um, so this is my life last summer. Um, and it is less than I used to work and more than I want to be working. Um, a few years ago, I was sitting next to Dan Wilson, um, former PFI president, during a meeting. And I was telling him about my farm and about my life and how stressed out I was. And he said, Kate, you need to take a day a week off. And um, it was really helpful for me to hear because I um, was not doing that. I thought that I needed to be out in the field um, either thinking about it or working at it all the time. And having that day a week off um, was really helpful. And knowing that other farmers in the area um, were doing something like that was also really helpful. Um, and so I uh, began to start to try to take a day a week off, and it really improved my efficiency on the days that I was working um, a lot more. The other thing um, that I, I want to talk a little bit about um, on my summer schedule is that every July I take a weekend off. And this started in 2011, um, a full weekend, not just off, but away from the farm, preferably out of town. Um, this past summer I went to Madison, Wisconsin for just two days. The weekend before, or the summer before, I went to um, Cedar Rapids, which, yes, is only 20 minutes away. Um, but I got a hotel for two days and just was completely off the farm. And as frivolous as it seemed the first time I did it, um, it has been incredible to help me get through the season. And it always seems logistically hard to figure out how to get everybody to take care of things while I'm gone in the greenhouse or the zucchini harvest or whatever it is. Um, but it has been really helpful in my um, mental capacity to get through the season. Um, the other thing that I've noticed is that every week I try to take an hour or so to do just something completely for me. Um, and that might be different for everybody what that is. but um, taking that time every week has been really, really important, um, especially to my, um, just to my feeling of mental health and, and work-life balance. Um, the other thing that's really helped me in my work-life balance is um, every year, and I strive to become a better, more, a better grower, um, and I have mentors in my life that have helped help me, lead me in that direction, and what I've noticed is that as I, I don't, by no means where I want to be eventually, but by learning um, better growing techniques, I'm able to get ahead of um, weeds and other problems in the field so that um, I am doing the least amount of work possible to get the job done. I remember the summer that I learned that you should cultivate before the weeds come up, not after they come up. Um, because if you're cultivating them when they're at the white thread stage, you're not doing as much work to get them out of the field. Um, and just learning that simple thing was incredibly helpful for me. Um, to, um, to have a better operation. 
and I think figuring out this intuition of when to um, the idea of when to walk away from your farm and when you have to put that extra effort in. Um, there have been many times when I've realized that I emotionally and physically could not do one more thing and I walked away. And at the time it seemed like a very frustrating or um, scary thing to do. Um, but in the end, it allowed me to have a perspective on my farm that um, worked out, it worked itself out in the end. One little example is the first time I took a weekend off in 2011, I came back and it was over 100 degrees and I decided that in the middle of the afternoon on a Sunday afternoon, because I felt guilty for taking a couple days off, I was going to weed parsnips by hand. Um, well, this was back um, when I had an 11 member CSA and I did not have anything in straight rows. Um, I didn't have anything that could be cultivated, um, which I've since learned is really important to have things in straight rows so that you can um, actively weed man manage your weeds. Um, and it just was a, it was a lost cause. And I remember realizing that I was not going to get those parsnips weeded and walking away. Um, and after reflecting on that instance, um, I learned a lot. I learned that I didn't want to grow parsnips. Um, I also learned that, that having the field be orderly um, was really important in order to keep the weeds out. And ultimately my mental stress was going to be better if I could manage the field better. Um, Another thing that's really helped me with work-life balance is having a community of people around me that I can call. Um, I know that in the middle of a season, I could call um, Susan Utes or Laura Krause or um, some of my um, fellow farmers in the area, Carmen or TD or Lindsay Kaiser, and I could say, how's the summer going for you? Are you guys doing okay? Um, I'm dying here. I need, a little, I need a little bit of a reinforcement. So having that kind of connection has been really helpful. Um, the other thing that I would say is that um, having systems figured out is really, really important. Um, Kristen's going to talk a lot more about this. Um, and I think up to date, I have really focused on having good systems for field management, good systems for pest management, um, good systems for a lot of the, the farm. But the one area that I haven't really focused on is good systems for employee management um, and, so, and motivation. So I'm really hoping that Kristen will focus a little bit on that. Because um, I th would, have a, would love to learn more about that. One of the actually really helpful things that I did um, a couple years ago, I was really struggling with um, how to figure out what to do in a day with employees. And I called Laura Krause and she said that every time that she walks out the kitchen before um, having a crew is she takes a um, junk mail and takes in back of an envelope and writes a list down and then shares that with her crew what they're going to do for the day. And having just that amount of organization has really helped me you know what I'm going to do during the day with my crew so I'm not just randomly going through, well, I think we should do this or that. So really knowing ahead of time what needs to be done has really been helpful for me. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is that I've noticed that field efficiency really can lend itself to a better work-life balance. Um, and that it can come through continually becoming a better farmer. Um, I've attempted to take one full day off a week, and I'm really noticing that it's a work in progress. Um, so there, another thing that I wanted to talk about is that in, I think it was the summer of 2013, I decided that um, I wanted to write my goals down, my life goals down. And I figured out that I wanted to have good work, good health, and good friends. And in the category of good work, I wanted to have a good farm, but I also wanted to be able to help other people become better farmers. And as I reflected on those goals, I realized that a good farm was only one-sixth of the items on my list, but I was spending 100% of my time and energy on that. Um, so that really ratcheted back um, the amount of time I was worrying and thinking about the farm, and I started... Um, making more time in my life for people, making more time in my life for my health, making more time in my life for good food. Um, and it's not been perfect because there's definitely moments when I, um, you know, it's really busy and I'm not eating well or other things like that. But I always kind of come back to those three um, goals that I made my, for myself, good work, good health, and good friends. And I think that that's really important to realize that um, it's all right to take care of yourself. It's actually really important because if you don't, you can't take care of your farm. You can't um, be the best boss that you can be. Um, and learning some of those basic self-care things for yourself um, can go a long way in taking care of your farm. And the way that you're able to afford to take some of those time off from your farm is by becoming a better, more organized farmer, which is incredibly difficult to do. And I feel like I'm still on that journey of doing that. Um, but the, the more that you can find people around you, good mentors, um, 
the things that we can learn from um, Kristen coming up about um, efficiencies and um, an organization, I think, can help us all. Because the more you're able to streamline your farming process, I think the more you're able to walk away from it and have a mental, um, maybe a little bit of a um, help mentally with the stress of it. I think the other thing that to, that I wanted to talk about was that um, historically farming has been um, a very stressful occupation that people don't um, don't walk away from in the middle of it. Um, it. You do it till you get the job done, and it was really hard for me to not feel guilty to decide that I was going to have a work-life balance and decide that that was important. And so that's something that I have um, really struggled with, especially coming from I'm a generation removed from farming, but I have um, farmers in my family. Even this morning when I talked to my 88-year-old grandpa about what I was doing tonight, I, I don't think it even registered about that, that there is a work-life balance in farming. Um, so on one hand, that's a disadvantage for us, um, trying to create work-life balance, um, that, that history of farming. Um, but on the other hand, it creates an opportunity. And then the other thing I want to say is that we can actually learn a lot um, from farmers of, of older generations because there is a rhythm to farming that I think a lot of older farmers have figured out, um, whether it's the um, you know day off a week or whether it's the um, different traditions and community item things that people used to do in farming and that we can recreate. So I really think that our community and sticking together, um, especially here in Iowa with PFI, that we have this huge opportunity to stick together and be each other's best advocates. Because farming, no matter how efficient you make it, no matter how many systems you add to it, it's going to be really hard. And I think it's community, um, and especially for us, the PFI community, that can help get us through that. Um, but it, it's kind of in combination with your own work of creating better systems and with learning. Um, you know, Becoming a better grower is so incredibly important. Um, one of the becoming better at your books. I mean, I was so confused about payroll one day and I sat, asked Laura Krauss, you know, how do you do your payroll? And she showed me, you know, exactly how she did it. And having someone, an older farmer, you know, with pen and paper show me how they did it was what made it click in my brain. Um, and so I think the more that we can do that with each other and for each other um, and both connecting on the emotional level of, yeah, this is a hard season. How can we get through it? but also on the farmer to farmer learning of like, this is how I do things on my farm. How do you do things? How can we learn from each other? Um, so with that, um, I think I'm gonna um, give it over to Kristen and i um, really excited to hear what she has to say about work-life balance. Okay, hello, can people hear me? Hope so. Yep, definitely can hear you. I'm gonna pull up your presentation now. Sounds good. Um, thanks, Kate. That was a great introduction. Um, I think our I think our farm histories actually do have a lot in common, um, which some of which will come out in in my introduction to my farm. So um, I'm farming in Stoughton, Wisconsin. Uh, it's about 15 miles outside of Madison. Um, so Madison is a, a pretty hotbed of CSA farms for the region. Um, there's a lot of competition for CSA. We've been in business since 2004 and um, started with 20 members. And now we have 180 members per week um, in our CSA. Steve, I'm forgetting how to forward the slide. <laughs> Yeah, it's just on the bottom left corner of the screen that has the slide of the pod with just the slide. Perfect. There's the arrows on that bottom left. Yep. <laughs> and then the pointer oh, arrow, if you great. want it, is up top. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we own 10 acres of land. Um, I started my business in 2004 on a rented piece of land that's about five miles from where I'm farming now. Um, but we bought this farm in 2007, the end of 2007. Um, after being in business for a few years. Uh, as Kate mentioned, I, I do uh, run and, and own my business solely, although I do live on the farm with my husband and my son, who's three. Uh, so we purchased the farm together in 2007. And so currently I'm farming um, about six and a half acres of vegetables out of eight acres in vegetable field. So we all know there's buffers and roadways and all sorts of things. Um, mixed up in that in that scheme and that includes uh, some rented acreage 
this square uh, that's adjacent to our farm to the north is is rented from a neighbor so we don't own this property right now but are hoping to to purchase it and add it onto our farm um, so kind of an odd parcel it's a it's a remnant farmstead of an old dairy farm and um, we have the original farmhouse and are surrounded closely along the road with uh, other non-farming neighbors we sort of farm their backyards uh, it's an interesting interesting setup but honestly it's probably what made this farm affordable to us when we were looking for a vegetable farm on the on the rim of madison where land prices are pretty high it sounds like they're pretty high um, where kate is farming too so at the present time we're farming six and a half acres of vegetables um, we have about an acre and a half in full season cover each year, cover crop, um, where we might have clover pasture for some livestock, or we might have uh, Sudan grass in to do some perennial weed control. And then we try to work in cover crops um, throughout the season in, in rotation with our growing crops. So we might have a spring cover ahead of a fall um, brassica crop, or we might have a summer cover of oats and peas following our onions or following a spring crop. So we try to work them in as much as possible because we are very land tight. Um, we need to kind of push our push our fields as much as we possibly can um, because we don't we don't have any more land and, and we, we're continuing to grow modestly each year. Uh, we have two propagation greenhouses. My original greenhouse is a 20 by 36 and then we built another one just a few years ago. Uh, 24 by 48. We use a germination chamber. We use um, what we call stretchers, these long PVC um, sort of racks that are in the lower right corner that can carry nine trays of plants in and out of the greenhouse. So if we're hardening things off, we can move them very quickly with two people. And then we're also using those structures for curing onions and garlic and squash like a lot of us do later on in the season. We have three hoop houses on the farm, um, two 30 by 96 and one 30 by 72. Um, we're not trying to push these spaces for a tremendous amount of production, but we do have very specific goals um, for early season market sales, getting people to our farm stand, um, high yielding, high quality tomatoes. We grow a lot of cherry tomatoes, a lot of heirloom tomatoes in the houses. Um, and then we do, we have a late fall share for our CSA that runs through Thanksgiving and we, we plant greens in the late season and also celery for those, for those shares. So those are our goals with, with hoop house production. And then one of those hoop houses is entirely you pick for our CSA members um, in cherry tomatoes. Field production systems, we're in, uh, we're on five foot center beds like a lot of us are. Um, we'll plant one, two, or three rows per bed, and we do a combination of bare ground and plastic mulch um, for, our, for our production, and also a combination of overhead and drip irrigation. We have two tractors, um, so Kate's one of me on that. I have a larger um, or large quote unquote tractor for tillage and um, mowing, plowing, all those sorts of things, plastic laying. We use a International Hydro 84. It's just big enough. Um, if it were any smaller, it would not do the jobs we're trying to trying to ask it to do. Um, and in the future, it might be in the in the cards for a, a little bit larger of a tractor to do some deeper tillage. Uh, our second tractor we got when I purchased our permanent farm. It's a cultivating tractor, Case 265. So a little bit newer, a little more versatile than say um, an A or a or a 140. Um, it does have a PTO and has a three point on the back where we run our Planet Junior seeders. Um, and then we have several different uh, belly mounted cultivation tools that we use with that. Um, some tools that on our scale we make a lot of use of. Uh, we have our, our um, set of three Planet Juniors that we mount on the back of the cultivating tractor. We also use um, those seeders to mark rows for um, uh, transplanting. We don't use a mechanical transplanter at all. Um, so that's what they're doing is hand planting into those marked rows. 
uh, from Knowles Farm Equipment in, in Iowa. We have a uh, plastic layer and a plastic lifter, which is a tremendously valuable tool for root digging and um, sweet potato harvest and undercutting carrots and things like that, in addition to taking up that plastic mulch. Um, we use a dibbler. We purchased one of these sort of newer um, Johnny's dibblers. I'm not so much a tinkerer or a fabricator. Many people have made <laughs> all sorts of very well-working dibblers, but I bought one and it works great. Um, we use it on plastic mulch. And um, this is uh, the crew marking for our onion beds. We use a reflective mulch to um, control thrips, which we find works works very well in our long season onions in particular. Um, we have a couple of these garden carts that are really helpful around the farm. We're not so big that we need to be driving all the time. So we use these carts that fit our harvest crates very well. They fit trays of plants very well. And we can send out a group of people with one or two carts or in different directions to be working around the farm. And then we also have a, har a cargo van that we harvest into. Uh, lots of hand tools. We're still hoeing. We're still um, using the little Johnny's hand hose all the time. Um, and then we're also, because we have a modest amount of deer pressure, we are hooping and netting all of our lettuce. It seems to be the only thing they're affecting so far, but we use a deer netting that's in the right side picture and hoops to to just keep keep the deer's the, keep the deer's tongues off of our our head lettuces. Um, harvesting, we kind of use the same, the the full gamut of Johnny's knives. Um, we use, we like those little Swiss Army harvest knives for greens, especially. We use those a lot, and then the field harvest knives um, for all sorts of other things. Um, we started the farm using black plastic bulb crates for harvest, which most people do. They're sort of a ubiquitous around here. And a few years ago, we invested in these um, bona fide vegetable crates from California that are amazing. Um, they they were such a good purchase and they, they're just super sturdy. They don't break, they don't warp, they nest nicely, they stack well. They've just been a really um, kind of a, a quality of life <laughs> improvement just in, in the frustrations that some of those crates have caused. Um, and we also use these harvest bags on the right uh, for some crops, not a lot, um, but some for former employees really like them and I've come around to really liking them, especially for, for broccoli harvest. Um, they're from Peaceful Valley Farm Supply. I'm seeing some questions pop up for sourcing things and maybe we'll get to those before we go into the second part of the talk. Um, washing and packing, we uh, have a kind of a repurposed dairy barn. Um, our farm has a, a small kind of combination tobacco dairy barn that um, we, we converted the milking parlor into a washing space, which is in the upper left. It's a tight space. <laughs> we move a lot of produce through there. Um, we also have a barrel washer in there that you see in the background, um, but it's worked quite well. It has a concrete floor, drains to a, to a, a um, trough that then drains out of the out of the barn so that's worked out very well um, there's an old milk house that we insulated and put a cool bot into and so that was our first cooler and we've since built a second cooler in the same style insulated room with a cool bot that works quite well it's a little bit larger um, and so we have two coolers that we can store vegetables in now, although the smaller one also gets repurposed for uh, tomato storage in season. So that's running at a much warmer temperature. And then we cure our sweet potatoes in that room as well. So we're holding it to 80, 80 degrees for several weeks after our, our sweet potatoes come in from the field. Um, so a few other things that even on our scale, we've um, really loved improving just materials handling efficiency. Uh, we don't have a bucket on our tractor, and so moving pallets of things was a real challenge. So investing in this uh, three-point um, pallet forks was a real game changer. We can accept freight deliveries. We can move our potting mix around, which comes in sling bags. And we can also move crates of vegetables in and out of the field. 
And so um, in the lower right, in the lower left, we're moving melons out of the field and that can be dropped in front of the barn and wheeled into the cooler if we need to. Um, upper left, we're um, dropping pallets of winter squash into our greenhouse, which doesn't have any concrete, but we throw down some um, plywood and we can move them around relatively easily with a pallet jack. Um, and then um, you can kind of see on the on the right, the barrel washer carrots moving through there, even on our, you know, we're, we're not growing a tremendous number of carrots, but it still saves us. We've, we've earned back the cost of that barrel washer over and over again and saved, saved labor. Um, and then a more typical wash set up down below where we've got our stock tanks and our, um, our, our rolly tables. And, and that's another shot of those, those crates that must be a, early summer harvest because those are our our leafy greens crates and there looks like there's a lot of them in there we do raise a small amount of livestock um, it's not a big part of what we do but we raise five pigs a year uh, 120 broilers and 75 heritage turkeys <coughs> excuse me you can see right there one of the functions that the pigs play that is a really actually a really important role on the farm is processing waste vegetables we create a tremendous amount of, of vegetable waste, whether it's rotten squash, like what we saw in the last picture, or just things that sat in the cooler too long, or things that weren't fit for um, distribution. Uh, we also have um, poultry that, that grazes over our, our fallow field. So if we have a cover crop for a full season on a field, we'll run our poultry over that, and it's a nice fertility contribution. And I mean, the main role that they do play, though, on the farm is to be be these meter greeters for our CSA members. Um, I'll talk about our CSA in a minute, but um, they're a big part of people's farm experience when they when they come to the farm. Our CSA program is is a bit unique for our area in that uh, all of our members come to the farm to pick up their shares. We don't have any drop sites. Um, and they all come on the same day. It's on Wednesday afternoon. And similar to Kate, we do um, a market style, or as she called it, a buffet style pickup. And that doesn't mean, in my case, a, a free choice system. Um, it is still a designated share, but we're not we're not packing any boxes. Um, people are sort of packing their own shares as they go along. So once they check in, they'll come up, go along this lineup where. Um, it, there'll be a sign that says, you know, what vegetable it is and how much to take. And there may be a choice there, take this or that, or take up to five of these if we have a lot of something and some people may want the full amount. And then of course we've got the like take it or leave it bin at the end. If someone um, doesn't want something that's offered that week, they can leave it behind or take extra of something that someone else didn't care for. So I like this system a lot. It tells, it gives people the chance to get acquainted with the vegetables as they're taking them home, and they can make those kinds of decisions about whether or not they're really going to use them. Um, but they also get this little bit of, I don't know, sensory experience of taking which cucumber exactly they want and which bundle of scallions they speaks to them. And I think there's there's something about that that people really enjoy gets pretty crowded in the mid season. And just a few more shots of the of the pickup and how it's set up. Oh. Hello. Um I'm not seeing anything can't on my see screen your slides. here. Keith. Say that again, Kristen. I'm seeing your slides fine. It sounded like you Kate are? said she couldn't either. I, I can see everything fine. Are you okay. not seeing it? Oh, yeah. it just popped up. I was getting a plain blue screen there for a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll Actually, when I when I clicked through these earlier, this you pick flowers picture must be a large image because it took a while to load. So that's it. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, so another aspect of the CSA that um, we offer to members is is the ability to you pick things when they're there at the farm 
Um, we have you pick flowers. We have you pick herbs. Um, we have cherry tomatoes and sauce tomatoes that people can go out and pick while they're in season as part of their share. And that's a really popular part of the CSA. Um, people really uh, get to spend a fair bit of time on the farm and, and get to see the fields and walk the fields. And it's a really busy time of the season um, with, a, with a lot of folks there on the farm. Um, our other major outlet for selling our produce is, is our farmer's market in Madison. We go to just one market a week. It's the West Side Community Market on Saturday mornings. And it's a fairly high volume market. It started in 2005, so right around the time that my farm started, and it was relatively small then, um, but it's sort of grown with the farm. And, and now I, I consider it a, um, a really vibrant, loyal, um, really wonderful market for, for us. And um, we uh, run a market CSA program there. So in addition to our cash sales, we have members who pay ahead for their market shopping for the year. A lot of people do variations on this. Um, you see on the lower left is our market share board where we have members' cards hanging. We don't send them home with them just to make sure they don't get lost. And But their cards, uh, they collect it up when they get to the stand and they choose their purchases. And then we, we mark off their purchases on the cards. And there's more details to the program if it's something you're curious about on our on our website, you can check out our information is up there. Um, but that's been a really, a really great way to get to know our market customers. And, and then they also get some additional benefits like coming to our UPIX on the farm and um, getting recipes and a little forecast of what we'll have at the market in their, in their weekly newsletter. Um, so that's been a, a newer part of the CSA, but a really fun I, I really enjoy those members a lot. In the springtime, something that's grown over the past few years is our seedling sales. Um, we started growing organic starts to sell at the market, and now it's a pretty major part of our spring business. Um, it's mostly tomatoes and peppers and eggplant and herbs, and then there's kind of a handful of other vegetable starts that we sell. Um, but it's kind of a different dimension to the business. I love talking gardening with our customers and um, people are just so excited in the spring to get get their gardens going that I find it's just a really satisfying part of of the business. Shot of plant sales, kind of a mid season market there. Um, and then a little bit about um, farm history by the numbers from me. Our farm started in 2004 um, just to let you know this data starts in 2007 only because that's when I started using QuickBooks and <laughs> had a little trouble finding good information before then so and but 2007 was also the first year that I had um, paid employees and so that first that was my first year with any sort of paid staff I had 55 CSA members at that time and three acres in production um, at the end of 2007 is when I bought my farm. And so I didn't do a CSA in 2008. I cover cropped my new farm and continued to farm my old farm on a smaller scale while I was getting things set up on the, on the new land. Um, my, my gross sales took a hit, as you can see, and um, payroll went up. And I think I netted like two thousand dollars <laughs> that year as I was getting things uh ready to ready to move over to our permanent land I also got married that summer it was pretty pretty interesting um and so then getting started uh with an eye toward permanency on the farm I was able to to invest in infrastructure um to build the soil and expand our production slowly over time there are never any giant jumps in our CSA membership our acreage kind of increased very slowly um, but was what was really a big year for me was in 2013 when I was expecting a baby in May and I was a sole farmer owner and I was even the only real manager on the farm I wasn't really entrusting any of my employees with management responsibilities or anything like that and so this was 
kind of a, a big game changer for me. I had to figure out, um, because I made the decision, I'm not going to shut down the farm. I'm going to keep going and, um, and, and figure it out that I'm going to have to hire some management staff. And so that year, you can see 2013, my payroll went from 38,000 to 81,000. That was a huge jump as I brought in these management, um, these assistant managers, two of them. And my payroll percentage of growth took a big jump as well. Um, but that year taught me so much. I mean, it taught, it forced me to um, create some systems on the farm so that I could walk away when I needed to. And I could entrust um, other people with the right tools, you know, with the right information to go out and do what I'd been doing. And part of that had to do with me just letting go. I'm kind of a control freak and <laughs> like things a certain way. And so I needed to let go of some of that. But I also needed to get a lot more organized. And for plenty of my farming colleagues, um, none of this is just not mind blowing, but I do not come naturally to uh, organization. I sort of fly by the seat of my pants and and like to think that I can keep a lot of things in my head. And for a certain amount of time, you can, and then things start to fall apart. <laughs> and so um, creating those systems that year really propelled the farm forward. And so then um, from that year on, I really um, was able to bring the farm into a greater level of profitability. Um, it, we were at six and a half acres, uh, six to six and a half acres, and we were selling more and more and more off that land. We were getting better at production and we were um, getting better at decisions that kept, um, kept us from losing crops, keeping us um, getting the best yields we can and harvesting things at the peak of their of their beauty and and ripeness and so all of that contributed to um to the position we're at now which i feel really good about you know the farm is is doing well um i'm earning what i need to earn from it and um and i'm not working myself to death the way i was five years ago and so all of that feels like a triumph <laughs> what i really admire about kate is that in year seven, I was not thinking about farm life balance. And I'm not sure if uh, if I didn't have my son at the time that I did, I'm not sure if I would even be thinking about it now. Um, I think for a lot of us, we sort of thrive on this, um, you know, on this ability to go, go, go. And when we sort of thrive on the intensity of farming without, um, without thinking about it in the moment in, in, you know, while we're doing it, that we really need to need to bring this into balance a little bit. And so, like I said, that 2013 was a, was a major change for the farm. Um, but it, it made the farm more, more productive, more efficient and more profitable. And so these are some of my lessons learned um, in, Many of you might have learned these long ago, but these are this is what I've learned. And everyone has their own take on farm life balance. And for me, it, it sort of has two sides. One is how do we spend less time farming um, and, and more time doing the other things we want to do in our lives? And then the other piece of it is how to be a happier farmer and how to really enjoy the time that we are farming and living more while we're farming. Um, so those are those are two parts of the or two perspectives um, that I'm coming from with these. So reducing stress during the season is a huge thing. And um, I think it was Claire Strader who first introduced me to this idea that we have a winter brain and a summer brain. <laughs> and um, the winter brain makes much better decisions than the summer brain. Um, it it makes more practical decisions. It has more. Uh, information right there at the ready to be able to make a sound decision. And so let it do its job. Um, make all of the plans and all of the decisions you can possibly make ahead of the season so that your summer brain doesn't have to do them um, because it's not going to do it very well. <laughs> and so part of that is, <coughs> excuse 
excuse me, um, thorough budget planning. I can't tell you what a stress relief it has been to be able to um, to be able to trust the budget. Uh, if you have something come up that you need to figure out whether you can afford it, to have this budget that you can look at and know exactly where you stand and what you can afford and what you can't afford takes a lot of that guesswork out. And that has been a real, just a real benefit to me, along with thorough crop planning. Um, having a plan that you'll trust and that you'll follow, like take the time, take the time right now to go through and make sure that um, your plans are what you want them to be. It doesn't make any sense to be in the heat of the summer, scratching your head and wondering if you planted enough beans. Don't plant that extra bed. If your winter brain told you not to, you don't need them and you don't want to weed them and you certainly don't want to pick them. So those are really important things to have at the ready by March 1st when greenhouse, greenhouse stuff starts. Um, create record keeping systems that key people are held accountable for and you're accountable to them. So this is part of my my uh, reluctance toward organization is I was notorious for saying to myself, oh, I'll write that down later or, oh, I don't I don't need to write that down because I just know it and that's useless. It's it's not useful to anyone. Um, and also half the time I don't do what I tell myself I'm going to do. And so we have these log books, whether it's in the pack shed or out in the field or um, at the farmer's market that we all interact with and we're all responsible to each other for making sure they're complete. And just involving other people in that made, um, made myself more accountable and, and more, more thorough in my record keeping. Lots of clipboards. <laughs> if you want someone to do a really detailed task and do it well, um, you got to write it down. And so we have tons of clipboards and we have tons of scrap paper and we're always making lists or we're always um, writing things out and sending sending people off with a clipboard. Um, people want to do a good job. And part of that shouldn't be sort of trying to guess what's in your head or guessing what you meant by something. Um, it's just better to have it all at the ready. Um, have a system for your own notes that works for you and and use it. I've tried every possible system for keeping keeping my own notes on the farm. I've gone to Chris Blanchard's talks and I've tried his little note card systems and things like that. And um, they kind of all fall flat on their faces for me at, at a certain point in the season. And so now I just have one notebook that I carry around all year long. It gets rained on. It's held together with a rubber band by the end of the year. And it has everything I need to write down in it, all jumbled up. It doesn't matter what it is, um, but it's all there and it's all chronological. <laughs> and so that works for me. And I can look back if I'm wondering, um, you know, what I found out when I researched fertilizers a couple springs ago, I can look back chronologically and find those notes. And that really works for me. Um, other people have great systems that work for them. Set challenging but achievable goals together with your key staff. So one thing, big change that happened when uh, I brought on assistant managers is that we started doing a weekly field walk, which I should have been doing much sooner, um, but I didn't. And it it made a huge difference in, in how we worked as a team on the farm. So every Monday we go out with this very simple um, work plan template that's in the picture there and we go field by field and just write down um, what we want to try to achieve that week. So we're not looking beyond that week at all um, with these work plans so that we can actually potentially get everything done. And um, we mark them off and we date them when they're done. And what I, re what I really like about this system is our organic certifier accepts them as our activity log, which I always struggled with a system for, for keeping and would get reprimanded by my inspector that we didn't have a, a full activity log, but these sheets kind of act as that as well. Um, think about any plans for growth and their implications across the board from staffing to rubber bands. So <coughs> 
again, reducing your stress during the season means having what you need when you need it. If your plans are calling for, you know, 200 more tomato steaks or tomatoes, you're, you're going to need more steaks. Or if you're increasing your CSA, that's going to have implications for all sorts of supplies, whether it's boxes or rubber bands or what have you. Um, you it's as many of those little things you can take care of ahead of time. Um, do it do it before March 1st or before April 1st, because it's going to free your mind up so much, all those little things. And if you possibly can, um, hire more help than you absolutely need to create some margins. Um, if you're trying to run with the, the leanest staff you can possibly have, which I did for years and years, um, if someone gets sick, you are screwed. And if you get sick, you're screwed. And that's a really awful way to be going through um, the season. And if you hire a little bit more and they, they get that flexibility to take time off if they really need it, to do normal summer things, um, you know, your budget may not be affected as much as much as you think. And that's the lesson that I learned is, is that you can sort of give people that freedom and and it's not going to cost you as much in payroll because people are taking a little more time off than they otherwise would. Hire your weaknesses. Um, that's one thing that was tremendous for me when I hired my first assistant managers, Craig and Lauren. They were sort of the opposite when it comes to uh, organization. They, they loved organizational systems. They had great ideas for how to organize things. It was amazing. And so we developed all these checklists and we developed these um, instruction sheets and log sheets for things that I used to carry around in my head and no one else knew or I'd, they'd have to come find me and find out, you know, what the application rate of the dipel is or what have you. And so all of that got documented with their help. And that was a huge push forward for, for the farm. Um, when you're doing your hiring, um, there's so many unknowns when you're when you're doing a hire and and trying to find someone who's going to be a good fit for the farm. But hiring compatible personalities, thinking about okay, how would this person fit in personality-wise with the rest of your crew, um, is a really really important part of of working together. Um, I've been really lucky to work with some amazing amazing people and. Um, I feel like now it's my responsibility to um, bring new people onto the farm that I know are going to kind of fit with with the spirit and the and and just the the vibe that's been created by the people that are on the farm already. The second big thing that I learned is improving um, my own time management, and so what that means is is trying to bring everything into the workday and out of the evenings. Um, I spent so many late nights writing newsletters, so many late nights um, preparing for market on Friday night that long after the crew left. And one of the things I was forced to do when my son was born was try to get all that stuff into the workday. And I thought it wouldn't work. Um, and I felt guilty that uh, I was inside writing a newsletter when the sun was shining and the crew was picking beans, but that's what I needed to do. And I needed to be protective of that time, sort of guard that time so that I wasn't tempted back out, <laughs> back out to, into the field. And I still end up doing that. But I think this year, I think this year I wrote two newsletters after hours, two or three, and that felt pretty good. Um, and then just accepting that your time your time is the most valuable on the farm. It sounds kind of egotistical, but it's true. Um, your time has so many demands on it that are different from anyone else on the farm. And I don't know how many times in the past I've found myself having to put aside my own personal priorities because I needed to supervise a group of people that was doing something else. And it, it, it's a really it's a really frustrating position to be in when you can't get to those things that you need to do most. So finding ways to remove the obstacles that um, keep you from being able to do the things you need to do most. Um, and then it, like Kate was saying, 
identify the lightest time in the work week and take time off and put it on the schedule. Tell people you're you're leaving. Tell them you're not available. Um, it's easier said than done. Um, it's taken me a long time to get comfortable with that. But again, having having my son kind of putting pressure on me, I think that that helped me to get get off the farm more during the summer. And I thought I didn't need to do that. I thought that I wanted to be on the farm all the time. It turns out I am much happier and I am more recharged just like just like Kate mentioned when I when I do get away and then the other lesson is constantly re-examining plans and markets so um, really being honest with myself about when th something that I thought was going to be a part of the farm that I envisioned just doesn't work and one of those screaming examples was the the hens I had laying hens I was doing an egg share for my CSA and it was not working. Um, it was really not working. And I was working way too hard for very little return. And so I had to pull the plug on that. And it was a great decision. Um, I also went to a lot, a lot of farmer's markets early in my uh, farming uh, and tried a lot of um, markets that were not very lucrative. And I was spending a lot of time there. And I needed to also just kind of choose the avenues for selling produce that had the best return. And so over the years, we've been really lucky to be able to um, minimize and kind of consolidate those. Final lesson is that <laughs> you need to accept that farming is hard on families. Whether you're farming with a partner or you're farming on your own, um, it is really hard. It's an intense season in the in the upper Midwest. We've got a lot we've got to get done in, in like three, four months of the the intense summer and and you know, all plans are subject to change sometimes and and flexibility and acceptance on both ends can be really valuable. Um, I had to learn that the farm's needs are always gonna expand to the time that you give it, like there's just an infinite number of things you could be doing and in order to balance that with my family life I just had to set a schedule and I don't work you know most days I don't work past 4 30 or 5 o'clock and I um, get home and I see my son and we do family things and and that's it um, on the weekends I go to the farmer's market and that's about it and um, we've tried to get some time uh, where my my husband can take my son on a trip in the summer and I can get all of my pent up farming energy out while he's gone. And that worked out really well for kind of a stress relief when, when things are really busy here. Um, but one of the things I had to come to terms with was that um, it's, it's become the case that my farming hours are kept very separate from my family hours. So I, I kind of, got pretty far away from the notion that I was going to have my son in the field with me and I was going to kind of be this hybrid farmer mama who was running the show and had my little toddler in tow. That is not the case. Um, when I'm farming, I'm farming. And in the off hours, we're on the farm and we're enjoying the farm, but I don't have any responsibilities to the farm. And that's that feels really different to me than what I had thought. Um, my farm life was going to be. And Cyrus is on the farm, but he's most of the time in someone else's care for those 40 hours of the week. Um, and so he can see what we're up to. He can hang out with us. Um, but I, I learned very quickly that when I was farming, I did not have the patience for him that he deserved. And I needed to keep those things very separate. And then when he is on the farm, um, he might come out and, and we'll hang out in the field together. But at those times, I I have no responsibilities to the work getting done. And my crew knows that. And we might disappear and go pick flowers and come back. And and they know what needs to be done. And, and the show goes on um, whether or not we're, we're there in the picture. And that was how it, it really needed to be, that I could disappear and come back if uh, if I needed to. All right, I know Wendell Berry is infinitely quoted, but um, 
this really encapsulates the whole work-life balance um, idea for me is um, we don't, we, if we do not live where we work and when we work, we're wasting our lives and our work too. So this idea that we're out there farming and, and just killing ourselves in the hopes of at some point in the future, having, having more time to live, it just, we're, we're not honoring the work that we're doing and we're not, um, we're, 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 we're not living a life that's whole. And I think that says, that says a lot to me. And it reminds me also of a, I was thinking about this today. It was a TED talk that I heard, I think a year or two ago about, um, a, a study on happiness where they were tracking people throughout their days on their smartphones and asking them at different times of the day what they were doing and rating their level of happiness and um, and a bunch of other questions too. But one of the, the key findings that they had in the study was that um, was that the, the predictor of whether someone was experiencing a high level of happiness had nothing to do really to the with the actual pleasantness of the activity they were involved in but it had to do with to what extent they were distracted um, by something else or that their mind was wandering so if they were thinking about what they were doing or they were present in what they were doing their their happiness was way higher than if they were thinking about something else i thought that was really really interesting and and part of being a happy farmer for me is to be able to enjoy being out in the field and the more i can take some of that stress of running the farm out of my brain when i'm out there um, the more i can really be present and enjoy the work of the farm and for me that's a big part of that balance and so that i don't need to be off the farm necessarily to get recharged i can get recharged in the beans <laughs> if i need to um, and so i just wanted to to share that. Um, I definitely want to get to questions now, but I want to share this in case people log off. Um, there's a, a conference coming up in February in Madison. It's the first annual um, organic vegetable production conference, and um, it's going to be awesome. There's a really amazing trailer on the website if you um, go to the, the UW Extension website. Um, and there's going to be a keynote and a panel discussion on this topic with Chris Blanchard, who hosts the Farmer to Farmer podcast. And um, I think that's going to be a really interesting part of this of this conference. And then there's going to be a lot of other production related workshops and things. So if you're if you're thinking about conference season, I think there, there's an early bird uh, registration discount that ends uh, relatively soon. So think about that. And I will leave it there. Excellent. Thank you, Kristen, for a really great presentation and some really good tips and good thoughts. And that was a really um, appropriate Wendell Berry quote. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so if anybody has some questions, pop them in the chat box. It looks like there was a few already, but Kate, I believe you, you prepared a few questions, right, that you wanted to, uh, to to ask Christian? Yeah, um, definitely. I kind of wanted to go back to this um, employee in the field with your employees um, and talk a little bit more what that's like because um, do you, a couple of specific questions, do you allow phones in the field, do you allow people to listen to music, or do you encourage them to be present in what they're doing? Um, we do not allow phones in the field unless someone for some reason is expecting a phone call that they really need to take then they can carry it um we don't unless you're on the tractor with your protection on we don't really allow or it's been actively discouraged that people wear um, headphones or listen to their own sort of personal music um, we often often have music playing whether it's in the pack shed or in the greenhouse or sometimes we'll even haul it haul out our portable into the field um so we can kind of share in the music but we don't we don't really have i guess it's never been a hard and fast rule but it's only come up once or twice that someone has wanted to use something like that and we've sort of discouraged it 
Um, and then can you talk a little bit about when you're hiring, how you find people that you think will be hard enough workers and be able to um, basically sustain themselves through the summer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> it's a really, it's, it's hard to know what kind of, what kind of an employee someone is going to be on the basis of the hiring process. So our hiring process is um, we, I put out a work announcement and ask for a cover letter and a resume and um, we'll contact people for a phone interview, which is only about 15 to 30 minutes. It's kind of an initial screening. Um, and if someone after that phone interview it sound, sounds like there's some potential there, then they'll come out to the farm for a working interview, which is going to be maybe three hours long. Um, they'll come out and we'll, if it's possible, we'll share a meal and have a farm tour and then have a work project of some sort. And oftentimes these interviews are happening in January and February. So work is really odd. <laughs> you know, you, you might be mm -hmm. doing a strange collection of things doesn't matter. I don't think it matters at all what you have people do. You can tell so much about people by just how they attack any job. Mm -hmm. And so I've really enjoyed that. Um, you can tell whether they stop working to talk. You can tell um, whether they can problem solve even in the most minor ways in that process. And, um, and you can tell a little bit about pace, not always, but um, but even just walking around the farm. You know, I'm I'm a fast walker, and if someone looks like they're not quite keeping up with me, then that's kind of that's telling. You know, there's a lot of little things. Um, and there's a farmer in Wisconsin here, Chris McGuire, a two onion farm, who um, has done a lot of presentations on labor. And I remember him saying long ago. Uh, you know, don't ignore even the slightest thing that happens in a working interview. These are people who um, should be on their 200% best behavior. And if you see something that doesn't seem quite right or get kind of an odd sense about someone's work style, like don't take that for granted because chances are it it's indicating an issue that's going to come back to haunt you. And so I've taken that to heart. Um, but I think in in recent years also, I've just really, really focused on this idea of um, people who I think are going to work really well together. I think that that has um, an incredible amount of benefit to a, to a crew. Um, if people get along well and work well together, they push each other along, they keep, they keep each other motivated, they keep each other happy. There's just a lot of good that comes from that that mm -hmm. um if you sort of ignore that in favor of someone who say may on paper look like they have more experience or they may um i don't know for whatever reason you think that they are more qualified um ignoring some of those or or discounting some of those personality um issues i think is it, it doesn't always go well Mm -hmm. Did um, One of the things that I feel a little bit um, stressed about sometimes is because I have a smaller crew at this point, this summer I had two people most of the week and then once a week I had four people, um, so oftentimes the crew would be doing something by themselves and then sometimes, like if I left them to go in the house and do a newsletter, it felt <clears throat> a little shitty of me to do that to them when there was just one or two of them out there. Um, did that get easier as your crew got bigger because you had another go-to person versus just like you and some <clears throat> new, unexperienced people? Like, I guess I'm wondering if there's something about the size that you're at, if that actually makes it easier for you to walk away a little bit. I think to some extent that's that's probably true. When there's more of a, a group, you feel less like your absence is going to have a big impact on lightening the load you know yeah. um i think you know I, I don't think i've really gotten too far away from feeling guilty when there's an unpleasant <laughs> job or when you yeah. know they're doing something crummy out in the rain and you get to sit in the warm office and do what you need to do or then you know there's it's hard not to feel bad about that but um 
but you have to, you sort of have to defend your priorities. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing is if you're, if you're out picking beans because you feel bad that someone's picking beans by themselves, but then something that only you can do, it isn't getting done. Um, that's a tough, that's a tough call. Um, you, so do you, you have a responsibility. Business. Do you explain to your employees that, that what you're doing and that it's important for the overall running of the farm? I, I definitely tell my employees what I'm doing when I'm not there. Um, I guess I don't, I don't go into much detail about how, because you kind of want to be careful, you don't want to say like, it's more important than what you're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but, but I think that they understand that there are priorities to running the business that need to get done. Um, yeah, and I think, I think explaining to employees that that it is your goal to achieve your office and your business management tasks during the workday is is a good thing for them to hear, especially if they're aspiring farmers. Um, because like you were saying earlier, there is this, this perception that we should be working all the time or give the farm every ounce of energy that we have day and night for, for a certain part of the year. And it doesn't have to be that way um, or we should be striving for it not to be that way because that's just a recipe for burnout. Yeah, along those lines, um, Danielle had a or Danielle had a question about. Um, did you see that one in the chat box? When you are stressed out or on a tight deadline, how do you communicate with employees so that the urgency is understood, but it doesn't become too emotional, stressful for everyone? Did you speak to a little bit to that? Oh, there it is. Okay, I'm just gonna review it real quick. Yeah, um, those are really. I feel like those are really important times to bond with with your employees. Um, it's just a really important time to communicate um, what it means to the farm that we achieve the goals that we that we need. I mean, it's something that we want to reinforce all the time, and we have kind of. I have this kind of routine of several times during the year where we have like a post lunch sit down, like after our first big CSA harvest, we'll, we'll have a big um, chat about, you know, what does it mean to harvest e efficiently and what does it mean to the farm and, and what are, what kind of benchmarks do we have for knowing whether we're moving at the pace we need to move. Um, so we try to have those conversations throughout the season. Um, but if something comes up, if we're trying to beat a weather event or we're trying to get something in um, as quickly as we possibly can, um, it's just a time that we need to rally together. And the, and the more, the, I guess the more we can, we can be, we can work through it as a team and say, let's, let's get this done. Um, versus I'm trying to think I was, I mean, I was, uh, an apprentice on a on a couple of different farms before I started farming, and I feel like I had, um, I I kind of came out of those experiences knowing how what kind of manager I didn't want to be, and I didn't want to be the the farm boss that came out into the field and and barked disappointment and orders and then disappeared again and that that was kind of my experience and and so i i just want to create an environment where we're all trying to achieve the same goals and and how can we rally together to get that done so um the other question was um in the chat box if you want to read that one how do you market your CSA? How do you plan your crops around your members and how many different produce for members weekly? Um, I can answer that first. In terms of the different produce for members, I go by the rule of thumb that I need to have um, eight items at least per week and that the greens such as kale, collards, and chard and herbs don't count, um, but lettuce would count for one of those eight items. And that's just a rule of thumb that a mentor told me once um, that I've used. Um, but I, I market my CSA a lot through word of mouth. Um, 
a little bit through local papers and Facebook, but not a lot. And um, <clears throat> I don't actually plan a, my crops around my members much. Um, I kind of have a set idea of what I want to do, and I try to change it a little bit each year um, in terms of making it more desirable for my members, but I don't actually do member feedback surveys because I'm a little afraid of what they would say. <laughs> um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, um, Kristen. Mm -hmm. um, I just turned up my volume, so let me know how the sound is because I see the comments about um, the sound not being good. Um, do, do, do. Let's see. So marketing our CSA. So we're in our uh, completing our our 13th season. And we at this point, we have a, a pretty high retention rate. We're lucky in that regard. And, and so most of our marketing is through word of mouth. And I have to say throughout our history, our most effective marketing has been through word of mouth. And if I were it's something I toy with every year. And if I were to do it all again, I would definitely um, work in some kind of a referral incentive to my CSA strategy because um, members are doing the marketing for me. And, and that recruitment is so valuable because there's that someone who's tied to an existing member who has some support entering the CSA and they're just that much more likely to be successful. Um, so it's just something that I really believe in. If you're looking for ways to spend your marketing dollars, um, offering some kind of uh, incentive to people who, um, you know, if someone signs up, but an existing member referred them, giving them a little bit of a, a discount. Um, we do uh, we do a member survey every year. I always have to like hold my tongue while I'm reading them sometimes because people can get pretty particular about the crop mix that they would like to see. Um, but I do think it's tremendously valuable um, for our planning. We've made we've made adjustments over the years based on that feedback and and it's a good way to just float an idea that you might be thinking about for the future. We've done that numerous times where we're thinking about making a change or offering something different and you can get kind of an initial gauge on interest that way. Um, but there's a limit to how much that feedback you can really put into place. And I think that's, that's an important thing to know before you put questions out in a member survey is if, if you don't plan to make any changes, there's no reason to survey anyone because they're going to expect something as a result of that of that survey but you know that it's the classic when you go down the list of crops you'll have you know half the members saying they don't they get too many beets and then the other half want more beets and so you have to figure out what to do with that feedback and there's plenty of that um but i do think that overall they're they're very helpful um and then we as far as our products um our shares vary probably in terms of items between eight and 15 items a week, depending on the time of year. Um, certainly there are times where those items are rather small and, and then there's other times where um, the value of the share kind of goes through the roof because our production is, is just really high. Um, it's something that we're always trying to keep, keep in check um but there's also that peak season that you want at least i want to kind of subsidize the very very light uh, or, or the little bit lighter part of the season in the early early summer um so i think that's all the questions there what other questions is there any other questions that anyone wants to type in yeah, we definitely have a little bit more time for questions if folks have some. I do remember that uh, Jenny and Jack, right at about the same time, uh, Kristen, during your presentation, asked about your field carts and your crates. Oh, I love right. how those those questions come up right when you see that picture. Yeah. Like, where'd you yeah. get those? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I do that all the time because you see things that are exciting. Um, these field carts that we have were part of a grant that um, a university person wrote 
in 2004 in our first year of farming. And so we, we were the beneficiaries of this sort of prototype. Um, but they've since been, they, they've since been put into production by some company. And I believe they're being sold by Johnny's. If you look in the Johnny's catalog, um, they have a variation on this field cart. And I also have um, the original plans for the cart. If anyone is a knows how to weld aluminum, you could make your own and email me and I'll send you those plans. It was originally designed by Dan Gunther up at Common Harvest Farm in the Twin Cities area. Um, so that's that. And then these crates that we purchased are, um, they're from, they're from California, although we have a Midwest distributor that we worked through. Um, I'm blanking on the name of them, but again, if you're interested, you could email me and I'll pull up that information. Um, we went in on a group order. They're, they're the cheapest if you can put together full pallets and have them shipped uh, that way. And so we got together maybe four or five other farms and we placed a group order. But they're not cheap. There's several different sizes and they range from 10 to $13 each. Um, but they're they're really wonderful. They're extremely durable. Um, we haven't had a single one break, even though they've been thrown around in sub-zero temperatures. And so I I do recommend them if if you have the means to make a purchase. Um, yeah. Is that the same company that you have your grains crates from, or is that are those different? Yes, those the the um, greens crates, those tan ones, are the largest size. Mm -hmm. And then we have a medium size that's green that's more for root crops can hold, you know, about the same as a bulb crate. And then we have shallow mm -hmm. crates that we use for tomatoes that can hold two layers of tomatoes. Okay. Um, do you have a, so on my farm, I have like on Mondays and Thursdays, we have our CSA delivery. And so those are all harvest and delivery days. And then um, Tuesdays and Fridays specifically, we try to do no harvest and work on like field field crop management and weeding and all that kind of stuff, except for the daily harvest, like the zucchini that needs to be harvested. Um, do you have a schedule like that on your farm, or are you harvesting every single day, or wh wh how how does that work on your farm? Yeah, we have a we have a pretty regular schedule as well. Once CSA kicks in, so on Mondays and Thursdays, we those are our field work days, so we don't do any harvesting on those days. Um, both mornings we have worker share crews that join us and so we're doing some kind of weeding task or um, you know large group crop well not large but group project we don't have very many CSA or uh, worker shares um, but those are our field work days and and I consider Monday sort of my lightest day of the week so when we we're talking about time that we could take away from the farm a lot of times for me that's Monday when I feel like I can I can be away and or one of my you know maybe one of the managers wants a day off but monday is always a good day for that um tuesday is our csa harvest so we're harvesting all day and occasionally we're harvesting into wednesday um, but usually wednesday we're back into field work mode um and then in the afternoon myself and one other person typically is is overseeing some worker shares as we bag produce and prepare the site for the pickup and then from three to seven we have the csa pickup on wednesdays um then so can, i don't inter interrupt yeah. you for a second did you on um, when you're getting ready for your csa share on harvesting um are you washing that same day or are you washing on wednesday we're washing things as they come out of the field so we're going so you're out. harvesting washing and then putting them in the cooler yep okay. yeah and then yeah. those greens crates are those completely sealed or do does any, do your greens wilt at all if they're it looked like there was some holes in those? Yeah, they're vented. Um they're they're heavily vented on the bottom to drain well and they're vented on the sides. We if we're harvesting say salad mix, we'll harvest into those crates, but then when we're packing into the cooler, we'll actually li line either the crates or or rubber made tubs with um plastic liner bags and we'll pour the greens into those for storage okay um, but do you... spinach okay. does just fine and bunched greens do just fine 
um, just in those crates and, and then we put kind of a plastic top covering on the top of the stack, but in between crates in the stack, it's just the, the crate on top of it that's keeping, you know, keeping things from being too exposed. Okay. But everything. So anyway, go back to your good. schedule. Sorry to really interrupt. <laughs> Friday is market harvest, so we're back. Friday is a full day harvest once again, and everyone on the farm is harvesting on harvest days. Um, and then on Friday afternoon, myself or one of my assistant managers will, um, you know, prep the truck, get the farmers market logbook ready to go, and so that by 4.30, we're like ready for market, which is a big change. You know, I used to do all that in the evening when I was wrapping up the last stragglers of things I thought I wanted to harvest. and But now it's just part of our schedule. And then do you have any books that you'd recommend for CSAs? Um, yes. I mean that not not particular to CSA, but um, some of the books that I've really gotten so much out of in recent years are like the um, Fearless Farm Finances, which is um, a joint project that came out of a series of Moses workshops, or at least that's where I got my copy. It's awesome. I would highly recommend that. And um, Wholesale Success, which was the the manual that Atina Diffley put together and did a series of workshops in relation to it, which it it makes no difference if you're doing absolutely no wholesaling. It's just a really awesome resource for every possible aspect of um, harvest and post-harvest handling and good, good management practices for um, food safety and just routines organizational tactics for keeping keeping things clean and, and organized. It's just really, it's a great, great manual. Things that you can um, photocopy right out of there and you've got a chart you can hang in your pack shed <laughs> on all sorts of different topics. What about you? I was going to add um, Richard Wiswald's book um, was, really, was really helpful mm -hmm. to me. Um, and then in terms of one specifically about CSAs, Elizabeth Henderson's Sharing the Harvest, A Citizen's Guide to Community-Supported Agriculture um, is a good book, too. So thank you so much, Kristen. This was so fun to learn from you. Appreciate you sharing all your, um, uh, your operation with us. Thank you, Kate. It's really fun to do yeah. this. Yeah, definitely. I didn't mean to interrupt, but thank you to both of you for taking the time to do this. And um, for yeah, fielding all these questions and preparing these presentations. Tons of really good information here. And we are over time, and I don't want to keep you any longer. So um, it's probably a good time to wrap it up. But anybody who's who's uh, logged in here still, Kate and Kristen both shared their email addresses and, and said they'd be willing to follow up with anybody if, if you are interested. So um, thanks again so much to, to Kate and Kristen, and, and thanks to everybody for tuning in and asking so many good questions. Thank you. Thank you. Happy New Year, everybody.